Good afternoon, Robert Scribbler. It is August 20th, 2018. Thank you for joining me for another climate change and clean energy video blog. Now for this segment, I'm gonna continue my discussion about this study in the proceedings of the National Academy of Sciences entitled Trajectories of the Earth System in the Anthropocene. And in particular, I'm going to focus on feedbacks and tipping points as it relates to this new study. But before I go into some of the details provided by this study and some of the additional analysis that I'd like to provide, I'd like to just talk a little bit about IPCC, IPCC scenarios as it relates to, to tipping points and, and feedbacks. And I'd just like to note that the, the IPCC uh, scenarios, the RCP, the various um, projected scenarios based on policy also include a carbon dioxide equivalent value. And so though these policies are primarily focused on human fossil fuel burning and human emissions, they give us a baseline understanding of what the Earth system could look like if we hit a various carbon dioxide equivalent values. And so they're also useful for understanding Earth system feedbacks once we, once we have a decent idea of how much change Earth system feedback produces by 2100. So for example, if you get more carbon in the Earth's atmosphere because the Amazon shifts to savanna and you have less of a carbon sink and more carbon emissions due to wildfires, in the Amazon, then it does change this number. But it's worth noting that the primary driver of these you know, states, these various climate states, is human fossil fuel burning and human carbon emission. And these feedback scenarios are, are indicators of of how the Earth system can, can give us a lot less space before we need to transition in order to avoid a hothouse state. So, so just something to keep in mind as, as we talk about tipping points. Now, I'd like to just look at this graphic that, that is provided by the new study and, and talk about how there are numerous various tipping points in the Earth system that could help accelerate the Earth into a new hothouse state. And for my particular analysis, we, we've talked about a lot of these in, in isolation. And, uh, but, but I just like to provide this graphic for you from the study so that we can think of them in total. And it's worth noting that that the ones that we're really concerned about right now are changes to the Greenland ice sheet, changes to the West Antarctic ice sheet, changes to the East Antarctic ice sheet, changes to Arctic sea ice and Southern Hemisphere sea ice, changes to the boreal forest or Northern forest region, uh, primarily as it relates to wildfires, changes to permafrost as it relates to permafrost thaw, changes to the jet stream, changes to ocean circulation or thermohaline circulation, changes to El Nino, changes to the Amazon rainforest, and changes to the Indian summer monsoon. We've also talked a bit about changes to the Sahel region of Africa, as well as impacts to coral reefs and, and overall ocean health as it relates to coral reefs. So, so just a general overview of, of the large number of systems that are impacted by climate change, many of which, if, if they are greatly impacted, may tip over into new states, and, and many of which have their own additive carbon impact, carbon cycle impact, if the states do change. Now, it's worth noting that this paper indicates a range of temperatures in which these various systems are in trouble of crossing tipping points. And it's worth noting that for the Greenland ice sheet, the West Antarctic ice sheet, summer Arctic sea ice, and alpine glaciers, 
that we are already in a range right now where these systems are, based on this paper, identified at risk of crossing thresholds, points of no return, where, where it's practically impossible to, to restore the systems to their previous state. And it, it looks like, and, and the present global warming range right now is about 1 to 1.2 degrees Celsius above pre-industrial averages. So it looks like that we are in danger, for example, of seeing a, a zero sea ice state in summers within the next decade, or, or, or possibly sooner, possibly a little bit later, but, but this is a, a tipping point that we've already reached, and, and loss of sea ice results in an increased velocity of warming at the pole because it reduces reflectivity at the pole and results in more heat trapping during summertime. Uh, Greenland ice sheet tipping point is probably in the range of about 1.5 to 2.5 degrees Celsius, and we're very close to that. Uh, we're already seeing a number of impacts to the Greenland ice sheet, and this has a major issue is a major issue with regards to sea level rise, but it's also an issue as it res res relates to ocean circulation. And if the Greenland ice sheet rapidly melts, it has a tendency to push a lot of heat into the deep ocean which affects other Earth system values and, and may produce an additional feedback by adding more carbon to the ocean, which reduces the ocean's ability to act as a carbon sink, for example. There are other systems that are impacted by that, but that's just one example. In addition, the West Antarctic ice sheet is already, I'm sorry, uh, is already in, in trouble because of the added heat forcing that we have added to the Earth system. And, and if Antarctic ice sheet melts, you also end up with issues with ocean circulation and increased heat sequestration. So those are just some examples of, of tipping points that are already in danger of, of being crossed that may have cascading impacts and actually long-term add more heat to the global system. So as you warm, more and more of these systems fall into danger. And it's arguable as to which exact temperature these systems fall into severe changes. It may be a little bit less than the range that's identified by this paper, or, or in some cases, uh, well, I actually, I'd say the risk is that that these systems are in danger at, at potentially lower temperatures that have been than, than have been identified by this paper, which provides more urgency for us to transition away from fossil fuel burning as rapidly as possible, because we don't want to get into a situation where more and more and more of these systems are coming into play, and the Earth system feedback is so strong that the human response beyond just cutting carbon emissions is unable to keep up. And, and that's a real danger. We haven't really yet, to a fine point, identified how rapidly the Earth system can feed back and how many, for example, gigatons, billion tons of, of carbon can, can feed back from the Earth system on an annual basis. But the high velocity of human forced climate change puts at risk the fact that, that Earth systems might feed back on a scale that is comparable to the human feedback in a 10% range, in a 20% range, in a 30% range, or, or potentially more in the worst case scenario. And if the Earth system is feeding back that strongly, it, it's very hard to, to prevent us tipping into a hothouse state. So it, it puts us more behind the eight ball when it comes to other human responses beyond just managing carbon emissions. And it looks like those responses are gonna become necessary, even though cutting to zero carbon emissions is absolutely crucial because the present velocity that we are warming the earth is, is completely unmanageable and, and is moving us toward this risk of a hothouse state. So, so a very basic understanding of feedbacks and there's a lot more to understand about feedbacks, but that'll be all for now. Thank you for joining me, and I'll be chatting with you soon.